Okay, thank you, Shantanu, and um, and good morning, everyone. So, am I audible to everyone? Okay. Um, so, this is a, a a short course on advanced coal utilization, but we'll definitely start with the with the some of the fundamentals, as is absolutely necessary before you can go into the advanced um, concepts. Uh, just a little bit of my background, as Shantanu has already mentioned, I'm currently a professor of uh, chemical engineering uh, at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I was uh, with, before that I was with the International Energy Agency uh, in Paris, leading their cleaner fossil fuels program for the G8 countries. Before that with Anglo Coal Australia. Um, on uh, demonstration plant development in gasification and drying, mainly dealing with Shell and RWE of Germany, Shell of Netherlands. And uh, before that, uh, as Shantanu said, I was um, at, with the CRC uh, Cooperative Research Center for Clean Power from Lignite, but my role was mainly to commission and run, uh, operate large pilot plants in Australia and also in the US. But I started my career working as a design and commissioning engineer uh, with DCPL based in the Park State office in Calcutta or Kolkata during that time. Uh, but after two and a half years I opted to go for commissioning um, at, um, uh, at the Korba uh, plant in MP. Madhya Pradesh and also uh, Angul, uh, National Aluminium Company's captive power plant. Uh, we also have to do a fair bit of um, uh, additional work uh, for different organizations nationally and internationally. So I sit on the um, advisory board for the IPCC and also the CINSW, which is Coal Innovation New South Wales, which is a state in Australia. I am also an advisor to the Clean Coal Victoria and um, a member of the Science and Engineering Advisory Board for the government of state government of Victoria and also the UN Economic Commission on Europe based, um, based in Switzerland. So that's my, a little bit of my background. Uh, the, we have a significant uh, Mainly because of my background in industry, I have uh, this research interest, um, interests uh, in which um, my PhD students have worked and are still working. So, so these are the work areas. So this is a little bit uh, old. Uh, this actually has now 18, uh, so it's not 17, and uh, two other theses currently under examination. And I uh, still maintain a group of, um, sorry, I mean, this is right. That's, that's a bit old. So that's 18 and uh, two master students, 18 PhD students and two master students. And I have 16 PhD students whom I supervise. So these slides will be available to all of you uh, anyway. Uh, so don't bother to take any, um, uh, take any photographs or anything. I, we are not that I mind at all, but this will all be available in the form of PDF. So, next one, um, uh, you will find me over there and uh, in our website. And some of the uh, past and current research projects that we have in the department that I lead are on this side. These are all, uh, in the, these projects are all industry funded and partly funded by the government. In, uh, in Australia, the government, uh, the government funding is not that great. We really have to uh, rely on this um, industry for all sorts of fundings. So these are some of the uh, areas that our students have worked and still working. The one at the bottom, these are relatively recent started only about two years ago uh, as the uh, processing of wastes of different kind, waste plastics, waste tires, electronic waste, and, uh, and of course municipal solid waste. As the processing of waste has become a significant problem in almost all the countries, we, uh, including Australia, so we have been asked to 
carry out research in these areas. So my, uh, the reason I'm putting this one in here is that if you have any interest on any of these areas, not the current, um, not the topic of the, the course itself, feel free to get back to me during the next uh, 10 days or so, or even afterwards. And uh, our students operate uh, several rigs as, um, as a part of their PhD program. Uh, we don't have any technical officer support as such, uh, um, unless it comes to um, fabricating la large rigs, such as that one, or welding. Everything else has to be done by the students. So this is a fluidized bed, uh, which have been, we have been using quite a lot in the last um, six, seven years. And we simply rejig it to different needs as um, the focus of research projects change. Um, this is an entrained flow gasifier, which we built uh, for a project funded by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. It goes up to 1600 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's um, uh, auxiliaries. And this is a smaller version of that one. That one is an entrained flow gasifier. This is also a gasifier come combustor, but it is drop tube, which means the particles actually drop rather than remaining entrained in the vicinity of the incoming or the gas or the reacting gases. So that's the difference. Some of the catalytic conversion uh, equipment and uh, very high temperature viscosity measurement. I mean uh, high temperature measuring the viscosity of the slags at about 1600 um, degrees centigrade. It's no mean fit. Uh, so that's why uh, this is a tailor-made equipment that the students use. And then a variety of um, reactors uh, for small scale work uh, undertaken by the students. And that's basically it. And uh, this, uh, this is a, a um, pyrolyzer for waste plastics and waste tire, which we have um, commercialized. And there are two different companies now building plants uh, to make um, liquid fuels from the waste plastic. And some of the samples are shown in here. And that's my group about a year and a half ago, but it, it obviously changes as uh, students graduate and uh, they fly away to the industry or wherever uh, the new ones come in. That's the nature of it, but that's a group a um, year and a half ago. So that's a bit about me. Uh, the way I want to run this course is not by just passive, not uh, through the passive learning mode, in, uh, uh, I absolutely detest uh, that. So at any stage, feel free to stop me. If you have a question, no question is silly question. Every question is important because I may have certain understanding and I may completely lose the perspective that you have in your mind. So at any stage, please raise your hand and stop me, uh, then I will know that you have a question. I will try to respond it immediately. If I cannot respond immediately, then obviously I'll think over it uh, overnight, and next morning I'll come back and give you the answer. So please feel free to ask me any question at any stage. And this is not an undergraduate course as such, and therefore I will keep it absolutely at a high level uh, at the end of the day, you all, you all will be trained to become engineer. Uh, of course, you will need to understand the fundamental nitty gritties, which some of which we will touch, and some of which we will go if you ask me the question. But otherwise, I will have uh, more application focus um, as I go on. But feel free to stop me at any time. Okay. So that's for the time being. Good morning, sir. I'm Nimish Pankarkar from IIT Bombay. I'm pursuing MTech. I'm in second year. And recently, I got my project topic, which is dynamic analysis and control of chemical looping combustion. Uh, Professor Goody. So I've recently got the topic, so I have not yet started much on that. But yeah, this process will surely help me. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. 
सर माय नेम इज आदित्य सिंह आई एम फ्रॉम आदित्य सिंह आई एम फ्रॉम एच बी कानपुर बी टेक थर्ड ईयर एंड दिस इज बिगनिंग फॉर मी माय नेम इज डॉक्टर अशोक दवे ओके एंड आई हैव बीन वर्किंग प्रीवियसली फॉर वेरियस यूरोपियन प्रोजेक्ट्स लाइक डिकाबेट एंड बागमारा एंड अदर्स सो साइड बाई साइड आई ऑल्सो डेवलप्ड वेरियस एसिड गैस क्लीन अप प्रोसेस I mean, uh, you know, trying to develop a process configuration similar to the silicon process or others. So and uh, yeah, and also analyzed uh, the techno-economic part for uh, the pre-combustion IGCC and like. So I mean, that kind of a work area. Thank you. Hello, sir. This is Amrit Anand from IIT Dhanbad. Sir, um, my topic is thermochemical conversion of biomass. Yes, sir. My uh, PhD, sir. I'm. It is a scholar. Yes, sir. Sir, Shalini Gautam, Doctor Shalini Gautam. Sir, uh, my topic is thermochemical conversion of biomass and coal. So, essentially, currently I am working on thermochemical conversion reactor. I am designing a reactor, and for the basic of characterization of the coal, uh, basic on size and the reactivity, so taking the reactivity and further develop the relation between uh, these all uh, samples. Coal samples, biomass samples, its properties to fluidized bed gasification. Currently, I am not uh, using. This. Currently, I am working on thermochemical reactor designing thermochemical gravitic gravimetric reactor. This is our new designing one, sir. No, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, I am Sachin K S from. Uh, uh, I am doing my uh, PhD from IIC Bangalore. Uh, my work is on uh, doing laser diagnostics uh, in uh, fluidized gas uh, bed combustion of of coal uh. huh? uh, good morning sir uh, myself brijesh kumar prajapati from iit dhanbad uh, in my phd research i uh, my topic is uh, production of high thin gas from biomass uh, in this uh, i am using pyrolysis way actually okay good morning sir uh, myself faraz hussain i am pursuing ms uh, from iit kanpur uh, sir i am uh, basically i am doing the simulation work but to get the understanding of the uh, this experimental work and and i am also interested to know about this topic so i i just came here to le learn the things yes uh, sir spray atomization using the eilerian sto stochastic approach my name is atish kumar sahu i am from iit delhi uh, my parent uh, i am a phd scholar so uh, i am the second year my work related to cfd simulation of entrain flow gasification and improving the char combustion models and also about the construction and experiment on pdt i am a graduate from iist i am doing phd from there and i am working on heat transfer enhancement through rectangular channel and non rectangular channels so my actually my topic is not related from this but i have never to listen to sir प्रोफेसर सुजय कुमार साहब फ्रॉम जे So we have a very uh, wide, um, uh, wide coverage of expertise as far as the expertise of you all are concerned. So that will be collectively, I think, it's a fantastic uh, range of expertise that we have. And um, obviously, during your own presentations, we'll be able to uh, learn a bit more from whatever you are doing. So that's wonderful. Uh, Uh, 
Now, the reason I'm, I mean, reason I'm saying is that I'm very conscious on um, having a balance uh, uh, in my uh, research groups. About 50, roughly 50 percent of uh, my research students, those who have graduated and currently are doing are about 50, are, are, are females. They are an integral part of the society anyway. Without them, we don't exist. So that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. Anyway, so <laughs> without digressing much, uh, let's, um, uh, because many of you do come from different backgrounds, so I thought we will start with a very basic understanding of where um, the use of coal currently is. This is a course on um, coal utilization, so that's what the focus will remain. Uh, but it will be good to have this sort of background in here. So, so this is um, that I've taken from the IEA's um, IEA Clean Coal Centers report, uh, my previous employer, IEA. Uh, as you can see, uh, for the different scenarios, uh, the prediction of the, uh, the current use or the use in 2013 and the projected use in 2040 and um, what it looks like in different parts of the world. So in as much as all uh, the talk of switching to renewables, which I strongly believe will eventually happen, coal still remains a integral part, an integral part of the energy mix in many countries. And you will see some of the statistics that I will um, show in the next slide. So whether it is US, I mean North America, Canada is an exception now, or EU or China or India or Southeast Asia, or the, or the African continent, it's still going to be a significant role that coal will play going forward. And um, this is I am, this data I have taken, which is openly available from Global Coal Tracker. This is an organization who do not like coal, so therefore their figures are likely to be very correct. Um, so um, it's the, that's the coal-fired capacity in different countries. In um, China, obviously. Um, is at the top, have our 973 gigawatt of operating capacity. China, I remember, took o overtook US in terms of operating coal-fired capacity in 2005. And since then, the trajectory of China's coal-fired growth, you can see in here, it's tremendous. It's from their domestic coal as well as um, imported coals from Australia, from South Africa, Indonesia, um, Ukraine, Colombia, all sorts of countries. So, uh, but at the same time, so the, the, the major figure that I'd like, to, like you to sort of take a note in here that's over 2,000 gigawatt, 2,000, uh, 2000 million. Uh, kilowatt uh, of electrical capacity uh, is currently exist, and these are the major ones, the top um, 20 countries um, relying on coal at this point of time in 2019. But there is a whole lot of plants which are also under construction, so uh, almost 12 percent of the current capacity is still under construction globally. So it's not an inconsequential number yet. There are some good and bad aspects of it. I'll come to that later on. Um, uh, this is another way of looking at the same number, uh, so just in a bar chart, so nothing new really compared to what's there in the previous table. But this is where I would like to draw your attention. Um, this is what was at the end of 2011, the operating capacity. And then through the cancellation of several um, units, and then also um, stopping uh, as of the aging coal-fired units in different countries, and the construction of the new ones, this is currently what it is. 
So it is considerably slow. There's absolutely no doubt about it. When I look at the overall figures, this is what is most um, concerning. The majority of the power stations are still over uh, very much old, say 20 years or older. They are simply, and these are very old generation units, subcritical unit, I'll come to that a bit later, and therefore are inefficient. They haven't caught up with the develop, uh, technology development that has taken during the uh, last, say, 25 years. And there has been significant development uh, in the technology. I'll come to that uh, as we go into the next figure. So this is another way of looking at the uh, capacity and the coal's role in power generation in different countries. So in the x-axis, we have different countries starting from Poland, South Africa, um, Australia, where I come from, PR, uh, China, Kazakhstan, India here, and this is the world. So just as an example, Poland and South Africa still heavily rely on coal for their domestic power needs. Um, of course, it's dropping, gradually dropping as renewable come in. Uh, but um, and some other means of power generation, base load power generation that come in, this is going to drop. Base load means um, the power stations which can supply electricity, generate electricity and supply it continuously. That's why it is called base load. Okay, and that's very important. That's not something, unfortunately renewable on its own can provide unless there is a coupled with renewables is coupled with um, storage, energy storage, batteries for example. But let's not go into that. Um, again, the take home message from here is that still a significant coal is still a significant provider of power in many countries and will continue to do so if the projections from IEA is any guy. Yes. Yeah. So no, I think I think you are absolutely right. Uh, coal is dropping, the proportion of coal is dropping for many reasons, a combination of many reasons. One is uh, the introduction of more and more peaking power stations such as the gas-fired plants. Gas-fired plants are usually, so when we grew up, uh, gas-fired power generators were used only as a backup as a for peaking power because gas is so, such a premium fuel, very expensive not necessarily widely available as coal is. So that one reason is the now we have more gas, not just the gas from the oil wells, but shale gas, for example, is also coming in. Um, the, um, the coal seam methane in some of the countries are also taking that role. So gas is one, definitely no doubt. Then you, will, you, you, you also have significant built up of wind and solar. Uh, so these are renewable. So that's also adding to the capacity, not necessarily the generation. Capacity and generation are two different things. Right? You can build a plant of 1000 megawatt, for example, but then unless it runs for X number of hours, then it's not generating the megawatt hour which is the unit of electricity. Megawatt is not. Megawatt is the unit of energy. So have I answered your question? Good, thank you. Um, I uh, put this in here. <laughs> I deliberately put it to the attention of our uh, ministers in Australia, which is 
depending on how the politics plays, um, you know, everyone has views. But as scientists and engineers, our role is to um, tell the truth. Not the half truth, but the full truth. So that's why I uh, brought him here. Let's not go into it anymore. OK, so the one observation that can be made quite quickly, that of the global coal-fired capacity in 2019, which is about 2015 gigawatt um, capacity, electrical capacity, only 27% of those units are supercritical units, which typically have design efficiency wise, design efficiency wise when they are first built, about 42% on higher heating value net. And they run at about uh, between 500 to 600 degrees centigrade main steam um, and the reheat steam temperatures. I'll come to that again later on. Only 12% are ultra supercritical. Now these are all commercially available off the shelf technologies. That the technology providers can give, give you a guarantee. They operate about 45% efficiency and steam temperature over 600 degrees Celsius. Main steam as well as the heat, both. First reheat as well as second reheat. Only less than 1% are advanced ultra supercritical, which operate at much higher than 45% efficiency, around 47 or so, but depending on the type of the coal. And they offer their steam turbine, uh, steam temperatures are in excess of 700 degrees Celsius. The rest all are subcritical units, and there is a difference between subcritical and supercritical. If you look at the steam table, you look at the um, um, triple point, um, you'll see that they're around the 222 bar pressure. That's when the trip, that's where the triple point is. So all the subcritical units, which are inherently less efficient, and the older generation units, they are they are predominantly subcritical. They are less efficient. There will be um, the world's second um, um, worst electricity plant, the FA least efficient plant was in Victoria where I come from. It has been closed down two years ago. Um, and the, the, the first one is in Nigeria. Subcritical sub unit. The point I'm trying to make in here is that uh, there was a tremendous impetus to go from subcritical to supercritical over the years because the technology, the first supercritical plant in the world was built in 1969, well before all of you were born. I was in the school then, but still now, 50 years later, you see how, how much it has gone. Why it hasn't become all of those or significantly large supercritical, advanced supercritical, ultra supercritical, et cetera, haven't um, uh, come on steam? That's purely economics issue and lack of policy uh, drive on the part of the policy makers. The, here, one thing that I also want to mention is that there was tremendous, uh, the, what the steam temperature will be, what steam temperature can be tolerated day in, day out, and 90% availability over the year, that depends on the metals. So the development of metals for the steam uh, tube uh, uh, between the boiler end and the the HP turbine, uh, to a lesser extent the IP turbine, the high pressure turbine and the intermediate pressure turbine, that depends on the availability of very high quality steel. So those developments started in the early 90s uh, in the, within the uh, R&D divisions of the boiler makers. But then Initial, then at some stages to take it forward, the needed government support. To some extent, it happened in the EU. To some extent, it also happened in the US, US DOE, uh, under two different programs, one called COMTES, C-O-M-T-E-S. Uh, if you Google, you may still find it. But then as soon as the GFC, the global financial crisis, struck the world in 2008, it stopped. 
that's one of the reasons why this number is so less. And you can also wonder, you may also think, what's the difference? Only three percentage point. It's a huge difference. Typically, one percentage point difference in efficiency or one percentage point improvement in efficiency, H higher hitting value based efficiency, results in between two and three percentage point reduction in CO2 emission. So that's not inconsequential at all. And it means not only just less CO2 emission, but tremendous improvement in the operating cost going forward. So it's not um, a uh, low figure at all. It's a very, very important um, statistic. Um, so here, I took it from the PowerMag uh, website, www.powermag.com. It's uh, openly available. This, um, this acronym here, HELI, stands for very high efficiency, high efficiency, low emission concept that the IEA started around 2008, 2009, that period. So HELI stands for the highly efficient um, units. So you can see where, and if you look, look at the color codes, blue is advanced ultra supercritical. It's only in Germany. Very little extent in the, uh, the other parts of Western Europe. Not even in China. So very, very low. But China has a significant amount of proportion of super, uh, uh, ultra supercritical units. The largest ultra supercritical unit in the world uh, is in China, 1100 megawatt. Uh, um, it's called the Waikigao um, plant um, in China. That's, that's their um, indigenous design. The point I'm still making is, is this black bar in here. Majority of the countries still rely on older generation, subcritical, low efficiency, high CO2 emitting units, disappointingly. But so if you, is it, yes, that's right. Uh, see, in majority of the countries, except China, to a lesser extent in India, um, everywhere, even in the Russian region, uh, these are all privately owned. And they are obviously the companies, they are, they'll have to look at their financial bottom line. Uh, to build a supercritical unit or ultra supercritical unit, uh, from, from the time EPA permitting, uh, EPA permission, Environmental Protection Agency's permission is given, it, in China it takes about 21 months. In uh, Europe, North America takes about 36, 37 months because of all sorts of regulatory regimes that the um, developers or the builders have to overcome. Some other countries is a lot longer. So during that period, who is going to bear the cost? So the major then focus has remained, okay, let's have the status quo. We, are, we have plant running, high CO2 emitting, who cares? Let's get the uh, electricity uh, out, get the money in. That's the reason. Purely economics. So it's a lack of policy driver on the part of the policymakers. That's what it is. So that's um, that's the status of the coal-fired capacity. That's this particular section that I wanted to start with. The bottom line message, the eco message here is that, in as much as we all would like to see low emission renewables come in, um, coal is going to play a significant role going forward into, into the near and intermediate term. Okay. So before I move to the next section, do you, does anyone have any question? We can have now or we can have during the break or uh, any time.
Yes, that is a very good question. The pressure as well. So, typically in the subcritical units, your steam pressure will be below 222 bar. The older ones about 60 bar, you are subcritical ones, you are uh, 210. I have seen few units. But um, then going to the supercritical one, mainly 230 to 240, mainly. But the advanced ultra supercritical and the, some of the supercritical ones, the one in Isogo in Japan, that I think that goes about 267 bar. So it all depends on the boiler feed pump uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the water, uh, in the condensate feed water section at what, uh, what's, uh, what type of boiler feed pump you have. Ultra supercritical, there no, no one has gone beyond 280 bar at this point of time because it's the very high pressure and very high temperature that has significant implication on the metals, the concentration, uh, the composition of the metals and of the tubes and their um, longevity. So one of the problems in um, steam tubes, post boiler into the turbine and then right to the um, condenser and back to the um, back to the boiler again through the feed water section and all is the is that as you increase pressure and the temperature of the steam you have to maintain a very low level of oxygen in the steam and the way it is done is oxygen is scavenged from the water in the deaerator which is between the condenser, the LP heaters, possibly the IP heaters as well, and the uh, high pressure heaters. Um, so the deaerator, which scavenges, which runs on the principle of Henry's law. Henry's law states that the solubility of a gas, which in this instance is oxygen, solubility of the gas will be minimum inside a liquid when the, it is raised to its saturation um, temperature. So, but it's easier said than done. You don't only need the temperature; you also need other oxygen scavengers. Um, so, so that's that's actually the reason. So the pressure has gradually gone up, but the it has more or less stalled at that level. Because of the leaks invariably because the, the one of the biggest source of leaks is actually in the condenser. Um, so you have the IP, uh, sorry, the HP turbine and then going back to the reheat and then to the IP turbine and then to the LP turbines, different sections of the LP turbines and, the, and then eventually through the expansion joints into the condenser that is the biggest source of leak. So that even though you have the vacuum pump or uh, the uh, extraction um, pumps to create the vacuum inside the condenser. And not every power station in the world operates with cooling water um, uh, condenser. Some are air cooled simply because of the scarcity of the water uh, in the near vicinity of the power stations. So it's, it's, it's the build up from leakage which is invariably will happen. You can argue that okay, pressure is higher inside so leakage should be uh, inside out but no, it doesn't work that way. In condenser, the pressure is uh, other way around. You, know, you have atmospheric pressure outside and vacuum uh, inside. So. Supercritical CO2 cycle. Uh, yes, that's right. In fact, um, if you look at the power Mac. Uh, uh, website, one of the recent uh, news items that has come out, that is why I have taken this one, that they have talked about the developments in the uh, metals uh, for bringing in, uh, for hopefully bringing in the supercritical CO2 um, uh, in the cycle as the working fluid. I have not actually followed the development of it all that much. Uh, myself, but uh, it's worth looking. I know that there is, uh, you can see some publications on a, at regular intervals coming into the academic academic journals, 
but to some what extent the it has becoming mainstream tec technical I doubt um, would have, we would have known it but theoretically it is definitely efficient I think it's all depends on the the very confusing policy signals that the governments are giving everywhere um, and uh, each politicians uh, near term horizon is until the next election which is three years to four years depending on which country you are from so the policy uncertainty or the lack of policy certainty is really an issue and if there is no policy certainty or over a longer term the technology developers are not going to take any risk to develop the units so gone are the days when everything was developed using government money but now it's all privatized I think theoretically it definitely can um, that's what has been um, raised at different times the the problem is I think um, who are the, who actually owns the renewables based plant and who owns the coal plants and the all the infrastructure is still through the physical infrastructure of poles and electric poles and wires going from here to there so uh, and those that's a distribution company uh, well I think in some some parts of the country they can go for CSP def definitely uh, where you have around the year or, or a very long duration um, solar availability uh, at a reasonably constant intensity so if both the uh, if the ownership of renewables and coal-fired power stations are in the hand of the same company the task is a lot easier but but technically yes that should work that should work but it's uh, who is going to make it work that's the problem correct this is all uh, boils down to policy and this is an important correct that's right so we as scientists and engineers we can devise all the solutions but to convince the policy makers who are not necessarily scientists and engineers mainly accountants and lawyers um, that's a different task yeah so you're right I think the word that you use sharing is really the key I cannot see a situation where in biomass will be in a particular country will be replacing 100 percent where you also have coal the two reasons for it one is in the existing technologies um, biomass has a different kind of composition compared to coal for example coal doesn't have any potassium in it every biomass source whether it comes from the agricultural residues to the fruit bunch branch fruit bunch yes and or uh, leaves or those kinds of biomass lignocellulosic biomass they have potassium to deal with in an existing coal fired boiler which is designed for coal if you bring in too much biomass then potassium creates havoc in the form of fouling and slagging and I will actually be take, uh, talking about fouling and slagging as part of my combustion fundamentals after lunch so there you will see it so my personal view is that biomass is never going to replace 100 percent coal but it can have a role and it happens in a lot of the European countries they have co-firing only up to 10 to 15 percent though because once the plant is built changing the burner configuration changing the handling system changing the preparation for the system for the fuel which was for coal to now also take into account biomass biomass and coal are completely different types when it comes to hard growth index when it comes to um, uh, chemical composition and when it comes to also moisture in many cases it's completely different so you are looking at very different uh, substantially different uh, sources of coal preparation and then firing it into the into a machine which is a boiler which was designed for something so so it's, so it's never going to become 100% replacement. But to some extent, anything that you can do is fine. So co-firing does take place in many countries already, Scandinavian countries significantly. 
you know, the, uh, up until about 2008, the world's most efficient coal-fired plant was in Denmark. <laughs> Nobody knew about it but until it was surveyed. All the um, uh, supercritical units, the top supercritical units performing. The, the reason it was um, performing very, very well is it's a cold country. So the cooling water temperature around the air is very, very low. It's a condenser vacuum that you can have. Condenser vacuum, it's, the, it's based on the ranking cycle, the steam tower, uh, the coal-fired power generation units. Forget about the gas turbine. It depends on the cooling water's temperature. That dictates the condenser's vacuum. That dictates the cycle efficiency. So that's one of the reasons. That unit uses co-firing. Shell's Bougainam, the world's um, first gasification plant, IGCC plant, built for coal, now uses 10 to 15 percent biomass, um, and also um, uh, the animal um, uh, animal um, uh, I mean waste animal based uh, feed stuff. So, such as uh, chicken litter. That's how they do it. So, it can be done, but only up to a point that the machine will be prepared to tolerate. So, the, you are right. So, so CO2 emission, the term is very relative. It all depends on the life cycle and where you draw the boundary. Okay. Everyone says biomass is CO2 neutral because whatever CO2 is emitting during its processing or its use eventually will be taken up by the tree if you allow it to uh, allow it to be planted and grow. That doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a long period of time, whatever the period is. If it's a fast growing tree, still be needing fast growing species, still be needing eight, 10 years. So over that time frame, yes, it is CO2 neutral. Wind, solar, wind, solar, etc. Again, on a life cycle basis, um, where you draw the boundary for the life cycle? It is from cradle to grave. Life cycle analysis means the total emission over the entire life journey of that particular fuel. From the time the fuel is mined to the time the fuel has lost its identity inside the boiler or gasifier or whatever. So that's cradle and that's the grave. Or is it from gate to gate? That means I have the power station here. That's where the, I will start my calculations at the inlet boundary and that's where I'll stop it. The point I'm making is that over a life cycle basis, you still have to dig the minerals to get the metal processed to process the metals to build the blades for the wind turbine and its structures. Solar thermals, panels, you still have to make them. So very highly refined silica. It doesn't melt at low temperatures. It takes very high temperature for its processing where the energy is coming from. And then once the panels just like batteries, panels also have their hysteresis loop. So over a period, they will lose their capacity to store the energy and give it. Then how would you dispose them, these huge chunks of it? If that is to be concerned, similar case for nuclear, if this entire scenario from that end to cradle to grave is concerned, then what is CO2 neutral? or what is negative CO2 emission. Over a very short period, short um, boundary, it may be negative, but over the long and the true boundaries, nothing is uh, CO2 neutral. But of course, some are less CO2 emitting than the others. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So the point I'm, I think you raised a very good point here. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that Again, I take the view that I am a scientist and engineer, uh, 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 even though I have worked uh, to convince the politicians and still do. But my task, I see, is to tell the truth and nothing other than truth in its entirety, in as much as I know. There is, a, um, there is an article that has come out in the Nature Scientific Report 
which is a very uh, prestigious journal open access. 19th of June, so very recent article, um, University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, the author's name starts with V, uh, East European surname. Please have a read of it. Uh, how much CO2 increase will take place purely because of the flare from the sun and its variability over. So she has looked at the data and somehow normalized it. Um, I was reading it only last night, so I couldn't get, get into the uh, details. But have a look at it, please. Nature Scientific Report uh, from the University of Newcastle upon time. Um, solar flare, if you uh, search that, and it's an open access, so anyone can buy it. A anyone can get it. Uh, I think it's, it, will be, it will be useful to have a read of it because sometimes we get only sanitized version of events, unfortunately, but that's not what we should be doing uh, as we get trained. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me uh, later on anyway. So let's now, um, uh, I have named it cold drying fundamentals. Wherever, uh, whenever you want to use uh, a coal, so, the reason I say combustion is faster compared to uh, gasification is that combustion, you always have excess oxygen available. So a power station boiler is typically uh, operates at 20% excess air, which equates to about 4 to 5% excess oxygen. So you have plenty full of oxygen um, to combust the carbon and the hydrogen. As you can imagine, uh, oxygen at a high temperature can burn anything, whether it's a metal or carbon, right? But in the gasification, what happens, and we'll see that to tomorrow's lectures, you have substoichiometric oxygen. So you have a shortage of oxygen because the purpose of gasification is not to produce CO2 uh, or, or to produce CO2 to the minimum. Uh, you have to produce some CO2 because of the exothermic heat that you will need to sustain the gasification reaction. But it is a substoichiometric oxygen. Therefore, the process becomes infin uh, not infinitely, significantly slower compared to combustion. It's purely the oxygen which makes it slower. So the residence time in a gasifier is much, much higher than the residence time in a boiler. Um, and uh, that has to be taken care of. And that is taken care of in the modeling of the boiler or uh, modeling of the combustor or the modeling of the gasifier. That is always done. So I have said that there is an impetus, strong impetus for drying the coal before it goes into the boiler. So now we need to know what, what is actually water in the coal. And there are different waters. And depending on that, sometimes drying can be very inefficient, very energy intensive. Water does not exist just on the surface. It also exists in the capillaries within the coal. It exists within the interparticles. They are bonded by the water. I will show you a figure for that. And then is the interior water dispersed throughout the coal structure. To some extent, the capillary water and the interior water, they mean the same. But you can imagine, um, surface water is easier to remove. But if you have a lot of water in the capillaries, which are only micron-sized capillaries, to drive them off from the capillaries is a major challenge. And sometimes, not sometimes, always during the process of drying, the pores, the capillaries, they, not, they do not remain as capillaries. They collapse. It makes the drying even more complicated sometimes. So it depends on, so you need to really know uh, how much of the water or the moisture in the coal is present as surface, present as uh, capillary water or internal water, and interparticle water and interior water. And there are techniques to find it. Okay. So this is what I mean. That, um, uh, that um, and I have taken it from the drying technology journal, one of the um, papers there. It's not my own figure. 
So, you have different cold particles you see this ones they have the interparticle water which binds them together it is no different from taking few pieces of paper and then soaking in the uh, in a drop of water they will have interparticle waters bonding them together. Then you have the interior adsorption water adsorption D not absorption B. Um, sometimes they act has act as adhesive as well. So it's called adhesive water, and inside the coals there are capillaries, and these are the capillary waters. Progressively, this the surface water, which is here, is easier to remove by heating. The interparticle ones becomes difficult, not too difficult, but this one are extremely difficult this ones are extremely difficult what is inside the coal particles and there is a challenge to it as well in the sense that if you want to drive too much of this ones then the structure of the coal collapses the particles do not remain as single particles anymore they became fragmented and that has got other challenges as you will see not for combustion but for gasification so it's extremely important so, um, so when you dry the coal, so there are different types of moistures within the uh, coal. So, when you dry the coal, you, it actually dries at a constant rate initially for a particular period of time, and then the drying rate gradually decreases. And beyond a certain point of moisture content, it doesn't dry anymore. It so the maximum amount of moisture that you will be able to remove from the coal depends on the environment where um, um, uh, you are drying it. It is no different from me walking outside in a, on a humidified day. The water will not evaporate, it will stay on my body. Exactly the same thing will happen here. Unless you are constantly removing it during the drying process you will not be able to dry it to the bone dry to 0 percent moisture. So, and for gasification particularly you need very very uh, low extremely low moisture content I will come to that not that much for, gas, uh, for combustion because it is a fast process. So, so this the take home message from this particular from this all these slides is that uh, how water is bonded knowledge of that is extremely important is good for you and important for your uh, modeling too. The particle size of the coal as you would expect the more uh, the larger the coal is more are the chances of capillary water remaining there. But if you can break the big ones into smaller ones perhaps hopefully by the grace of God you will be breaking the capillaries and taking that on out during the milling process maybe maybe not. Pressure and temperature of drying ideally you need both relative humidity inside the dryer and the just example that I just gave size and the physical nature of the particles to be dried. So, see that later on. I mean 100 percent removal of the that is done that is done with some difficulty because it needs to be done for gasification plants and I will come to that uh, when I take the, give the gasification part of the lecture, but it is a good point that you are raising up front. Any other question from anyone? So, the, of course the conventional belief is that if you can do things at a higher pressure then the, job, then the reactor will become smaller. No exception when it comes to drying as well. Um, so, people have tried to do drying at 1 bar uh, slightly over atmospheric pressure to 3 bar to 5 bar to 7 bar etcetera. And uh, as a function of different particle sizes um, this is the German work at Brandenburg University funded by Wettenfall. Uh, what they found is that there is a there is an optimum particle size there is also an uh, effect significant effect of pressure on the drying. Uh, rate. Uh, this is the um, 
this is the um, this is the indication of the rate at which you will be able to dry. So there is an effect of pressure. There is an effect of uh, particle size on the drying, as you would expect. And uh, this is a an example of how pressure and temperature uh, pressure uh, can affect at a particular drying temperature. It was about 150 degrees centigrade, uh, not 150 degrees centigrade, more than that. Uh, for as a function of different particle size. The important thing, let me see. Important thing is the drying has to be the decision on choosing the drying technology, and I'll come to that later, has to depend on your knowledge of the coal that you are trying to dry. Why? These are the figures that I have taken from my own work uh, back in the late 90s. When you have a lignite or a very raw coal, in my case it is brown coal, if I looked at it, the morphology under scanning electron microscope, this is how it will superficially look like. Then I increase the magnification, this is how it will look like. So all the capillaries, the internal water and etc. that I was talking about, they were all here. If you go with higher and higher magnification, then this is what it, you will see. Very well defined capillaries, but also ultimately a section comes where it is extremely smooth and you cannot go beyond that. So all the drying has to be done between this and that. By the time it dry, the coal has come to this, you cannot dry it anymore. Inside that structure is impervious to the drying medium completely. And it has got other challenges for combustion units, particularly fluidized beds, and also gasifier. And I will bring up these figures, this micrograph, again later on. So the point I have, I'm trying to make in here, from left to right, the electron micrographs show progressively woody character on the coal surface. And it's extremely important to know this through fundamental research whenever you are doing technology development work. Scientific research is absolutely sacrosanct. You cannot say that I will just try it and then see what happens. Yes, it will take many, many years, very long time. But if you do it systematically, you cannot go past scientific fundamentals. That you need to know everything very clearly and the fundamentals of it. That in this case is the knowledge of the physical characteristics of the coal. So how do you measure particle size? Does anyone know? Define what? Sphericity. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But in general, say I have given you uh, one kilogram of coal. How do you measure its particle size? Sieving is one, right? So you have different sieves available that you can buy. And the companies have certified that this sieve is, is, is all 10 micron size, or that's 50 micron sieve, 45 or 125, etc. So you will use it. But, but sieves are, are sieves um, circular? The opening of the sieves. These are predominantly rectangular, right? I'll come to that. So sieving is one of them. Then you have the light scattering, which is called the diffraction sizing. Okay. So what is the principle of diffraction sizing? Okay, the principle of diff eh? really no, not really size. You don't have to go to the that size really. It's the me scattering. Okay, M I E. So me scattering principle. The, okay, scattering uh, works on the uh, principle that you have a volume uh, where coal particles are kept dispersed very very well with the help of surfactants, with the help of circulating liquids, essentially hoping that the coal particles will remain as coal particles, not agglomerated together, questionable, 
or you have to make an assumption. Make sure that the assumption is realistically achievable and then do it. Okay. So, what then happens is you have a whole range of cold particle uh, size, uh, different particle sizes in, inside that volume. Uh, if you look at the diffraction size of the equipment, say Melbourne diffraction size, that will you, you will see. So, a light beam comes in at a particular wavelength. When the beam falls on the cold particle, because it is a particle, what happens to the light? Part of it is absorbed, does not come out at the other end. Part of it is transmitted, depends on the diffractive index of the particle itself, its medium, uh, particle, yeah. Part of it is um, diffracted and part of it is scattered. Usually, and so there is the particle here, range of particles here, the beam going at a single wavelength, scattered into different directions, and on the other end, you have the detectors mounted in different circles. Smaller the particles, me theory will tell you, they will be scattered at a wide angle. Larger the particle, they will be scattered more towards the constant. So, depending on which detector has uh, uh, detected how much, you then back calculate this proportion of the particles within that volume is of this size, is of that size, is of this size, and that gives you the particle size distribution. It still is an assumption that me theory based on uh, uh, spherical particles. Okay. So, we get, we uh, simply for the sake of simplicity and lack of are not really requiring to know the exact shape of the particles for gasification and combustion purposes. We tacitly assume from sieving or from uh, diffraction sizing that all of my particles are spherical share and this is the distribution that we are getting. It is very, very it's, oh, and there are other ways as well. Uh, uh, um, I mean, the Coulter counter um, uh, it's, it's actually on a counting basis. That's a different principle. But you have to you have to start with somewhere. Sieving is the most uh, sieving is the easier easiest one that we do. But sieves do not work very well if the coal is moist. Sieves will get blocked, and sometimes if the sieves are not very clean, uh, if they are blocked from the previous use you will not see the um, uh, good size distribution. So, every technique has its pitfall. Me scattering diffraction sizing has its pitfall. You really need to know, you really need to do it many, many times to get a good, um, uh, good uh, representation of the, uh, uh, the size distribution. Otherwise, everything else will fall down. So, I have seen our PhD thesis and others do not m talk about the how many times they have measured and therefore what the variability of it. I said, okay, let's do it. Uh, I'm running out of time. Let's do it in one afternoon. We'll take three measurements and then average it out. Stroke of luck, it may work. <laughs> Most likely it won't work. But do remember that it, every technique is an is, an, uh, is, is, is giving you some information uh, uh, given to you by an instrument which needs to be operated by you. So, you need to know that beast very, very well, that it is behaving properly, just like the cat or the dog that you have at home. You have to know that it is. So, so that is what is size is. Okay. Sorry, I have digressed a bit, but it is important. Uh, so, there are some fundamental work. Uh, one of my students who did uh, on drying, he now works um, at the University of Washington at um, St. Louis. Uh, he, he looked at uh, different types of coal, brown coal from Victoria and very hard Chinese coal, Shenhua coal, looked at, um, looked at very careful measurement through different techniques by freezing out the entire coal particle uh, at, uh, at a temperature to freeze out the water, capillary water at that sort of temperature and detecting that, uh, um, uh, detecting the trough. And from there, 
calculating how much water is actually present there in the capillaries. Sometimes PhD students are meant to do it. Engineers need to know it, that techniques are available if needed. So let's not go into it, but the point that I'm trying to make is that depending on the type of the coal, you can actually, you can actually determine uh, how much is there in the capillary, how much is in there in the surface, how much is there, in the, how much is the internal water uh, or interior water, etc. That there are techniques available, and your interpretation is the most important thing. Um, so, and then he he then uh, looked at um, uh, the composition after drying the coal. Uh, that the brown coal has a different kind of composition compared to the uh, Chinese uh, hard coal. It's purely because when you are drying, depending on the temperature at which you are drying, coal has, coal is a combination of carboxylic groups. There are a lot of carbons in the matrix connected with hydrogen and oxygen. So these are the carboxylic groups, the CWH bonds. Some of those bonds actually do break, as you would expect, when you subject it to pressure or temperature or both during particle as uh, during drying. So that's what induces some of those changes. And you need to know that because that will have an effect on the uh, on its use when you are gasifying or combusting it, what actually will go out in the gas phase. Are you removing some of those during the pre-drying or not? Okay. So uh, um, I, I will uh, have the slides available, and you can read from uh, read those um, uh, at your leisure later on. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, every coal is different, and you need to know it. And there are ways to know uh, knowing the different types of water that is present uh, inside and milling breaking down the coal when it first comes from the mine does have an effect on the subsequent drying process. Important is then how long will it take the coal to dry, a moist coal to dry, because that's how you will size it. If a coal takes very long time to dry, then you will need a very large, uh, a, a dryer which can give you that sort of residence time. So knowing the uh, time is very important, so he did a lot of uh, measurements uh, in a purpose-built um, purpose dryer, laboratory dryer, using air as the drying medium, using steam as the drying medium, and this is the sort of information that he generated as a, as a function of particle size. Simple uh, experiments, but very good engineering information. And then uh, they, uh, looked at uh, different uh, temperatures of drying, different velocities of the uh, drying gas going to the dryer, because drying is a kinetic process, means it will take time. Its uh, drying efficiency changes with time, that therefore it's a kinetic driven process. Uh, and therefore, and air and steam are two different types of gases as far as specific heat, it is his heat content is concerned. So they will have, they will have different drying characteristics um, when you use them as drying medium. Of course, having hot air is easier, is cheaper. Steam is expensive, but, but some of the coals, when they dry, get dry, they become very spontaneously combustible. So air drying is not for them. I give you an example. Uh, back in um, 1999, uh, no, this was in 2002. So we were running a large gasifier. So we were drying the coal um, in the daytime, and then uh, essentially storing the dry coal for the night shift and the next uh, morning shift. And then the morning shift people will come and dry more. So we are not storing. So we dried the whole day, stored about five ton of dried coal, went to home to have dinner. And then by the time we were halfway to the dinner, the fire services called uh, me that you have a fire there. Uh, why? Because the coal has dried. It has become very spontaneously uh, combustible. Depends on the type of the coal. Some of the coals have a lot of oxygen content in it. 
mentioned, uh, remember I mentioned right at the beginning that the coal has carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen and ash. If some of the coals, our coal has about 25 percent oxygen in it, inside it uh, when it is dry. So it's very, very reactive. With the slightest amount of heat available, it will just flash. So that's what happens. So steam uh, fluid, uh, steam drying has its advantages that it provides the inert environment, but it's expensive. You take, you need energy to make steam, and then to use it for drying. So it depends on the situation, but that's what is dry. Uh, and then again, uh, for different types of coals, uh, these two are Victorian brown coals. One is, and you will see about it, uh, its composition later on. One is a very high calcium containing coal. The other one is a high silica containing coal. And this is a Chinese coal. So they have different character, drying characteristics. Um, and, and there are some other conclusions. The point that I'm trying to make in here is that there is absolutely no alternative to knowing your coal or your fuel intimately. You really need to know it, that how much water is there, not just that, but how water is bonded and what happens to its composition when it is dried. Otherwise, the choice of the drying technology and subsequent use of the coal can be, um, uh, can be um, problematic. And then there are a few others. Uh, the, the other pro issue is that coal, coal drying is very important, but you cannot store it very, uh, for a long time. Because once it is dried, it tends to reabsorb the moisture. <laughs> so you, ideally, you'd be running the drying plant and the, uh, the, the boiler plant close by, so that the, there is a minimum storage that uh, you need to have to avoid spontaneous combustion, to avoid reabsorption. Because depending on the seasonal variation, some of the dry coals, some, some, uh, sometimes uh, in some seasons you have a lot of moisture in the environment, so they will attract uh, a lot of moisture. Okay? So that's also important criteria. Um, this is again for um, academic uh, interest, nothing else. I'll go read it and some, uh, some associated conclusions on the moisture reabsorption uh, part of drying, uh, the moisture reabsorption characteristics of drying. Now, this does not have to be captured in modeling, though. But it is an important information that you need to know for operations pur operation purposes. Modeling will never capture it. Neither is needed for modeling to capture this. And then he looked at the, um, what happens to the particles, how they break as the coal is dried. Uh, because you may start with this size, but it, it, the distribution may grow as it generates during the drying process. They become more and more friable. Okay? So you need to, so that's what he did in here. And, um, and then he looked at uh, inside the dryer. In his case, it was a fluidized bed. Fluidized bed depends on the velocity of the fluidizing medium, whether it is hot air or steam. And therefore, that will have an effect of attrition of the dried particles. And he did go into measuring this. And then eventually, he uh, came up with a way to model the attrition as well so that people can say for, to the engineers that, look, if you are drying it with hot air or with hot steam, this is the sort of attrition-based particle breakage that you can expect to have. So that's the rationale uh, for this sort of information. And then the yield strength of the dried coal is also important. Because when you have dried the coal, if you are using it for a uh, gasifier, the gasifier, in the gas, if the gasifier operates at higher pressure, not atmospheric pressure, then you cannot pneumatically transport it all the way from the dryer end to the gasifier. You have to store it in the lock hoppers. Uh, and I will come to that during the gasification stage, uh, gasification lecture. Lock hoppers means pressure. 
So the strength of the dried coal particles is important. That is why he measured it. Okay. Do not bother to look at the values. These are relative values. The important thing is to know why it is not done and why we need to know it. Okay. So now let us come to the major dryer types. Uh, we have some time, right? So we will finish this and then we uh, go for lunch. So the major dryer types, um, uh, the I have uh, listed in here only few uh, dryers, so the ones which I believe are commercially available. There are a few other very, uh, if, it is, um, uh, if it is combustion or gasification, not, not so much liquefaction, which is not at all a part that I am interested in. Um, these are the steps, the uh, drying then pyrolysis, ignition of the um, ignition, then combustion of the volatile matter and combustion of the residual char. It is extremely important because not all coals are the same. When you have, I will come back into it a bit later, when you have, so drying is an integral part, is the first part of any coal processing. Um, uh, uh, coal processing uh, technologies, whether it is a combustion based technology or gasification based technology. The reason I uh, thought we should talk about coal drying, first of all, uh, before we go into anything else, is that there are whole varieties of coals available. Some are very high quality coal, which means they have less moisture and less ash in it and some have very high moisture or high ash in it and those are the poor quality coals or the low rank coals as we call them. Sometimes we call them lignite, sometimes we call them brown coal simply because they look brown, they literally look brown when they lose their moisture. And we have in Victoria, we have brown coal, we call them brown coal for that reason. I will come back to dry, drying again. About 45 percent of the world's coal reserves are low rank coals, lignites. So this is um, um, the resources, reserves and the accumulated world production. This is actually old data, it is from 2011 that I took, but more or less it has not changed, the proportions of them have, have not actually changed. Important thing is to realize that it is a massive resource that uh, is still there. Whether in the name of curtailing CO2, you will keep them in their ground and then do anything else, that is another, another story that I am not going into it. The data that I have taken is from the IEA statistics, which is not readily available to everyone, but the BP energy statistics is 2009, about the day they actually publish it every year now and it is openly available. It is a fantastic source that uh, you should all be looking at. And this is, these are the countries where you have plentiful of the low rank coals and you can see that literally almost every continent has significant proportion of this low rank uh, energy resource. These are also low cost at the same time and that is why they are attractive. Yeah. Yeah. So, good question. Um, so, I have what I have done is I have come to your um, the answer to, of, to that question. Uh, the um, the point I am trying to make is that so called lignites or the low rank coal or low quality coals are a, a strong proportion, represent a strong proportion of energy source for power generation currently in many countries, some of these in here. Now, what is low rank or what is high rank? Coal has always come from lignocellulosic biomass. So the, the mango tree that you have outside, if it dies or it is chopped up and if it is subjected to high pressure and temperature over a short period of time or pressure and temperature over a very long period of time, it becomes coal eventually. The, the more time it has spent, 
it has become higher rank. Uh, the shorter, the younger ones are lower rank, simply because they haven't got the time to mature from highly moist um, uh, biomass to um, to um, to uh, very high carbon uh, uh, high rank core. So rank is usually defined. Um, there are ASTM classifications, American Society of Testing Materials, ASTM, ASTM or sorry, ASME classification, sorry. And then Indian standards and European standards, you name them, which defines how a coal rank is defined. Usually, if a coal has low moisture and low amount of ash, these are high rank. If they have either high moisture or high uh, ash, or both, they are low. In between you have, so starting from the high rank one, highest rank possible is anthracite, which is so mature that it is very, very difficult to burn, okay, anthracite. Then you have the uh, bituminous coal, then you have the sub-bituminous coal, then you have the lignites, and even below you have peat, which Ireland has plenty. In Victoria, where I come from, uh, we have brown coal. It has about 60% moisture in it, but once you can drive off the moisture, it has got only 2% ash in it. Nivelli lignite, for example, and we call it brown coal because if we dry it, it becomes the color of your shirt. So that's why it's called brown. I mean, not exactly that dark, but it's very, very brown. You can see it's called. Uh, Nivelli lignite, for example, uh, is what, about 10, 12, that percentage ash, not as low as brown coal, but certainly not as high as some of the high ash coals that you see in this country. But it has about 30, 35% moisture, still significant amount, but not as high as the 60% moisture containing brown coal that we have in Australia or the brown coals present in Mongolia or in Germany. Germany had a tremendous amount of brown coal. They're all closing it down, um, the mines gradually. So that's the difference. So it's all different, uh, differentiated based on the age through which they have gone through. And therefore, the moisture content of the ash or both, that really, engineering sense, that's, well, that's how these are classified. Yeah, so what will happen is if, um, so coal has, um, composition-wise, there are two ways of um, um, defining the composition of coal. One is called proximate analysis, which does, just tells you how much volatile matter is, uh, is there. Volatile matter means when you hit it, it releases the vapors, volatile combustible vapors. Some are combustible, some are not. Then the fixed carbon, then the ash, and of course, right at the beginning, you have moisture. So that's one way of classifying the coal in terms of proximate analysis. But that doesn't give you the complete picture. You really need to know how much carbon is present, how much hydrogen is present, how much nitrogen is present, how much sulfur present, uh, is present, um, how much oxygen is present, and how much ash is present. So C-H-N-S-O and ash plus moisture, that constitutes what is called ultimate analysis. And there are standards available to measure those ones. You cannot just do it willy-nilly by anything that you like and then say that my coal has 70% uh, carbon and 4% uh, you know, hydrogen. So in general, irrespective of the type of coal, you get between 4 and 5, 6% hydrogen at most, not more than that. Ash can be very variable. Uh, from 2%, less than 2% in our uh, part of the world to 40, 50% in this part of the world. Um, and depending on those two, the other components obviously will vary, right? The carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, so if 
these are low the carbon number will go up hydrogen is as I said will more or less are always the same irrespective of how old these coals are low rank high rank coal etc so so proximate analysis ultimate analysis then the other important analysis for simulation purposes for calculation purposes for boiler design purposes for gasifier design purposes is extremely extremely important is what's the composition of the ash what is there in the ash so let me digress a little bit <clears throat> the term ash is actually a misnomer when you take a piece of coal it doesn't have ash in it at all what it has is actually the minerals where the minerals came from as our mango tree which was which is biomass can became in, uh, uh, um, uh, with passage of millions of years it has taken all the minerals from the soil that's where the minerals are coming from minerals of potassium minerals of silica minerals of uh, titanium minerals of calcium minerals of magnesium minerals of sodium depending on where they grew if they they grew in the uh, near the coastal areas they got more salt in it chlorine and sodium and the potassium those type of things in their matrix so the biomass has to start with and for that matter the coal to start with in its matrix what is called the mineral matter no ash is only when you um, subject the coal to thermochemical processing and convert it to whatever and I'll come to that the minerals convert to something which is called ash so ash is something that we measure in the lab how do we measure it we thermochemically convert it get rid of the carbon get rid of the hydrogen the nitrogen and the sulfur subjected it th to thermochemical treatment that it has the mineral matter has become ash and that's what you see but to start with a pristine coal as it is dug from the mine does not have ash in it so please keep that in mind. a lot of the journal papers <laughs> they do not make that distinction unfortunately but it's important to know it so coming back to this um, so the, the lignites are a strong source of power generation uh, energy resource and this is the graph that I um, devel, uh, sort of built for the policy makers so that they can see while I was working at the IEA in this um, right hand uh, sorry in the x-axis you have the ash content of the raw coal so before it has been processed uh, the, or, or it has been processed the, raw, the ash content in the raw coal as it is measured and in the moisture content on the left hand side so this box one it belongs to the type of lignites which you call brown coal that are available in Australia if you see this particular box number 10 this is what you see this much moisture ash content to this much moisture content range in the vertical axis that's what you will see in China so the 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 purpose of showing this graph is that the quality of the low rank coal or quality of the lignite is not one unified standard it varies widely and that has tremendous consequence for the design of the processing units whether it's the boiler or the gasifier what will you design the boiler for will you design it for this one or also include this one or include that one as well which will which means you'll have to make the boiler design extremely flexible therefore more expensive and therefore electricity cost will go up and that has got another another significance the plant that you are the boiler that you are designing today say it is your company's boiler you have asked someone else's company to design a boiler based on one of those right and they operate well using that coal for the next five six years the coal runs out from that mine 
they're looking for another mine, another source of coal. If they, that source of coal also conforms to this requirement, it's fine. The boiler will work very, very well. But if it goes this way, then we'll start the problem. And majority of the coal-fired units, their problems of low availability and all sorts of other low efficiency um, operation, that stems from it. To design for something, and it has been asked to operate far away from where its original design point was. And that's a very important thing to know, that uh, what is the quality of the coal that you will be, um, subject, that you will be uh, designing your boiler or the gasifier for? It's very, very important. And then if later down the track, if the quality changes, then you know OK, this is also how it was designed. Now we'll, I'll have to make some changes in the design. Whether that's economic or uneconomic, anyone know? I mean, that's, that needs to be assessed. OK? So uh, if the moisture content is high, this is the effect of the boiler size, if you like. So this is, there is a book written by Bob Dury, or edited by Bob Dury in 1992. It's no longer available from Butter. Worth Heinemann uh, is part of Elsevier now. If the moisture content increases, then the boiler size increases, height-wise, cross-section-wise. So this is what uh, it is, showing the consequence of high moisture-containing boilers is that uh, the consequence of high moisture-containing coal, the use of it in a boiler, is that you will be looking at a very large boiler. It's a significantly high capital cost if the moisture content of the coal going into the boiler is very, very high. So that, that is the impetus for carrying out pre-drying of the coal, reduce the moisture, and then feed it into the boiler so that the boiler becomes a lot smaller to start with. Okay, so, so that's the effect of the moisture content. And I have uh, uh, listed a few other uh, advantages of drying. So that's why drying is necessary. Now, to what extent you need to do drying depends on whether it is combustion or gasification. Combustion is a very fast process. I am jumping a little bit. Therefore, combustion units, boiler is a combustion unit, can tolerate high moisture. But gasification units, IGCC requires gasifiers. Gasifier, gasification is a slow process, order of magnitude slower. They cannot tolerate high moisture at all. And you need to bone dry the coal just before the coal enters the um, gasifier. Otherwise, it will not work. I mean, theoretically, it will work. Modeling will not detect it. But operationally, you will have problems. And I will show you from my experience a few things later on. So the, um, uh, the other issue is that if you do not pre-dry, then you have a significantly uh, dr significant drop in the efficiency as the moisture content of the fuel going into the boiler increases from left to right, the efficiency drops. And remember that the efficiency, one percentage point efficiency increase is two, two to three percentage point efficiency uh, improvement in uh, uh, CO2 emission. Okay. So there is a, so it's not only an economic driver, but also an environment in the drying of the coal. So, so it's the specific volume of water vapor that is the key. The boilers, the pulverized coal-fired boilers, they all operate uh, except where you have the fireball uh, in the slagging zone, slight vacuum, where everywhere else is more or less atmospheric pressure. So it's atmospheric pressure. So pressure is not a, there is no pressure to compress the volume. Is the, if you have more water vapor, there will be higher specific volume compared to the other gases, which is predominantly carbon dioxide. Because the product of combustion is 
predominantly carbon dioxide and water vapor and unconverted uh, plus ash and unconverted gases uh, and some of the pollutants such as gaseous pollutants such as carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide which can, we cannot talk about and we then told them through CFD modeling and then some measurements that uh, don't try to dry all in one single dryer right from one end to the other end do it in two stages it will be a lot easier the quality control the control of the moisture content that you eventually get will be a lot more controlled if you do it in not in one stage but in two different stages and these are the some of the fundamental research which have been attempted which are in some cases will still be needed to do if a new coal comes in uh, I have listed in here which you will see or the issues on this is one of the books that we have published recently at uh, for the CRC press earlier this year um, so so that's basically it uh, for the drying section so it's a very as you can see uh, I have kept it at a very high level I haven't gone into the fundamentals long equations for drying kinetics my intention is to give you all the issues bring out all the issues ask get questions from you address those and then if needed go into the nitty gritty so that's how I will be running this course um, for the next ones so I will start with the combustion fundamentals the rates of drying I wasn't intending to um, but some of the references which are there uh, the for RW is um, steam drying uh, RW is technology steam drying is uh, references details are not available they will not give it but if you uh, look at the PhD thesis of one of my students his name is David Stokey whose, whose results I have given in here that provides a lot of the equations for the for the users we decided to run that project so that we make those information available uh, the fundamental equations that needed for that are needed for uh, doing the CFD modeling for the dryer designing a dryer all sorts of things the, so the um, time that we have shown and the uh, modeling for the attrition of the particles fine particles that generated these are all there um, but uh, in the interest of time I'm not intending to show these ones in here but these are publicly available in journal papers as well as the no the, um, so for two stage drying process what I mean is that, um, that um, instead of drying it from starting moisture of 50 percent all the way to equilibrium moisture of say 10 or 12 percent you rather do it from 50 percent to 20 percent in one stage because that's very much manageable then in a smaller will be compact it will not be a very long one it will be this much first and then this much second the second one rather than doing it all in one because operationally that will be a lot more sim a lot simpler so that's this and uh, I believe that's what they have taken on board so the important thing I'm all always uh, always say yes I'm an engineer I'm a practitioner but um, the practice comes from fundamental principles there is absolutely no shortcut to the design I mean it cannot be done on a heuristics basis you can do to some extent but to other ex, uh, in most cases it will fail whether it is gasifier design or dryer design or boiler design or oxy fuel firing etc most fundamentals need to be established first uh, all the known unknowns have to be uh, addressed all the unknown unknowns have to be identified and then addressed otherwise you cannot proceed Mm. 
So, <coughs> so say for example, pharmaceutical industries, the food industries are biggest users of drying technologies and there it, it has to be done differently. Um, so, for them uh, you have slightly different, these are smaller volume but uh, high throughput capacity, uh, high throughput um, uh, processes. So, there again the principles will remain the same, but the scale is different, nothing else. Any question for anyone or have I bored everyone to death? <laughs> Digest it a bit of time, yes. Yeah. So, what I will do is um, as we end, I, as we end, I will uh, send the PDF uh, to Shantanu so that it, you can view it over the next few days and then can ask me questions uh, this week, later this week. Correct, correct. Seventeen millimeters. Yeah, it is possible. Uh, the larger the size, uh, easier it is to fluidize. But it is difficult to gasify it because it takes so much time. So your requirement comes from the downstream processing. So whether it is entrained flow uh, uh, gasification or fluidized, ga fluidized bed gasification, that tells you what should be the size of the product going to the fluidized bed gasifier or the entrained flow gasifier. And based on that, you then select your drying technology. Yes. I haven't chosen, it's chosen by RWE. So, what the point I made was that roughly you need to have a 50 degree centigrade difference as the driving force between the drying temperature of 100 degrees if drying is done at atmospheric pressure and the temperature of the saturated steam which is used as the heating medium. What RWE found out is that instead of using 6 millimeter particles or 10 millimeter particles, if you pre-mill it to a smaller size, then you do not need to supply 150 degree or 151 degree or 160 degree steam, you will be fine to supply 130 degree steam, which is roughly 3 bar. So, that is cost saving. So, that is where they came from. At the end of the day, if the process is not cost effective, no one is going to buy it. Right? So, even a 10 degree saving in heating temperature of the steam is beneficial because you are looking at steam produced at lower pressure and therefore lower temperature. So, you have to establish it case by case. Milling is, uh, is cheaper than um, uh, simply because the milling technologies are so well advanced and milling uh, large coal is lot less energy intensive than accomplishing the drying at uh, high pressure or high temperature or both. 
So that's why it is. So I, I do not know exactly what is the optimum temperature or the optimum particle size. Uh, let's, um, let's think it this way. Say you have chosen to establish a gasification plant and you have chosen to have an entrained flow gasification plant. Could be fluidized bed, chosen to have an entrained flow gasification plant. Immediately, the technology developers will tell you, I need at my entrained flow gasifier 100 micron particles, or there about 75 to 125 micron particles, dried coal, and that. So depending on that, so that's the dry coal size that you have to produce at the outlet of your dryer. At the inlet of your dryer, what is the coal? Whatever you are getting from the mine, whether that's 60% moisture or 50% moisture or 40% moisture, whatever your mine gives you. And in order to get 100 micron after drying, taking into account all the size reduction that takes place during drying because moisture has gone out, because attrition has generated uh, uh, fines. Once you know those processes, then you decide, okay, how much, to what size I have to do the milling of the raw coal before it goes into my dry. So that's how it is. That's how the decisions are made. All I have done is to bring out all the issues that one needs to be. Uh, aware of when choosing the drying technologies that you need to know what temperature you will do the drying, whether you will uh, do the drying using hot steam or hot air, if so at what temperature, oxygen content in the hot air case is a very important issue to consider okay, from, oxy from explosibility point of view. So the, and that attrition is a fact of life during drying. So all of these issues that I have uh, brought out, but I don't think anyone actually knows that this is the fine size. This is the exact size it will be optimum. You have to find it out after considering your objectives that have been given. So it's, it's, it's like a PhD project sometimes, as you say, um, um, that here you have a problem, and here you have not a single black and white solution, but different solutions, a set of solutions. You then decide, and each, each such set of the solutions are affected to some extent by different variables. You then decide what to you as the client is the most acceptable one. If economics is the criteria, or if plant availability is the criteria, or availability or non-availability of the steam or hot air or attrition is a criteria, or everything is a criteria, right? So that's how it is. Uh, uh, when, uh, okay. That's again a very good question. Entrained flow drying or entrained flow gasification, entrainment means a very narrow size. And you cannot go beyond 75 to 125, whether it is drying or, but because you see, entraining a 200 micron particle or higher would be a challenge. You will require a lot of velocity. A lot of velocity means a lot of Fluorate, right? And um, that's it. less resistance. Okay, so entrainment means entrainment uh, and drop tube is uh, two different things. Uh, dropping is two different things. Okay. So this is my reactor, for example. Um, simply, simplest uh, concept of co-current feed of the particles 
having a certain particle size and the gas having a certain velocity. From Stokes law you can calculate for a given velocity what should be the uh, limiting particle size when the particles will run ahead of the gas and then fall out which means the particles won't be seeing the gas constantly in its vicinity faster than the correct faster than the uh, uh, velocity of the gas and remember it's not only the velocity of the gas its temperature is also changing during drying it is becoming cooler entrainment means the gas and the particles are always entrained. This is the gas, this is the particle. The particle is not going ahead of the gas particles, gas molecules. The particles are not going like that. The particles are not, uh, the gas molecules, the drying gas molecules are not lagging. So that means the particle is always within the, the correct. That's right. So that means the gases are entraining the particles. That's what entrainment is all about. Whether it is entrained flow dryer or entrained flow gasifier. Correct. Uh, yes, uh, yes and no. So what will happen? Say, in the countercurrent case, gas is going that way, and you can argue that the particles will always be seeing the gas in its vicinity all the time. But the fact is, here the gas is uh, at the highest possible temperature, and here the gas, gas is at the lowest possible temperature, right? And here the particle has the highest amount of moisture. So that is a little bit of a tricky thing to manage because then the drying rate here has a lower driving force because the temperature of the gas is lowest here. And here it, when it is dried at most, here the temperature difference of the driving force is higher. So, I mean, the, there are different, uh, uh, different um, philosophies behind it. The Koreans are saying that, look, we can do it better this way through the countercurrent. Uh, I know why they are do it, do, do, doing it, but let's not, <laughs> not say. Increasing the resistance time. The Koreans, what they are doing is they are not doing it this way. They're doing it this way. So all the particles are falling here. And then there is another one. Then partially dried ones are falling this way, this way, this way. And then this dried ones are coming here. More contact, more resistance. And drying, as I said right at the beginning, drying is a kinetic driven process. It is a kinetics based process. So time based process. So you need to somehow give it time. And they have given the time with the help of uh, baffles. But in any case, the important thing is to have the gases always in contact or the particles always in contact with the gases somehow. No, there will still be interaction, but the particles are never, uh, never escaping the gases. In the co-current entrained flow, the gas temperature and the drying uh, and the drying part, the, sorry, the gas and the drying uh, dried particles are always in close proximity to one another. They are not separate. So the cold particle is not falling faster than the gas particles, gas molecules can uh, go for travel. 
they cannot be enveloped in the true sense. They cannot be enveloped, but if you cannot envelop something, then what you do? You give it more time. That's what they do. If you can give it entrainment, no, particles are also going slowly because they have to encounter this resistance of going through here, depositing here, and then coming here, then I'm doing here. So, if, if it is truly, if it is entrained floor drying, it will be very fast. But, if it is not entraining, then you will have to give it, give the coal particles more time. And that more time, longer time, is given by baffles. It's not, it's not entrainment though. In the state sense. Yeah, so um, depends whether the pressure drop is a significant factor or not, um, because you will not care about the pressure drop of the dried coal particles, but you will be caring about the pressure drop of the hot air because that will that is related to the pumping power um, the gas blowers electricity requirement or power requirement um, yeah steam is uh, compressing steam is a very intensive uh, it's still they call it um, well uh, if you need, you will definitely need to compress to about 3 or 5 or 10 bar the steam, the vapor compressor. That's why it's called vapor compressor. No, no. So let's uh, go into this. Um, the RW is one, I think that's what you are referring to. Um, So, here what's happening? The pressure inside the dryer is 1 bar, but the pressure inside the heating tube has to be higher than 1 bar. So, the in, in um, what I said that you need to have about 50 degrees centigrade higher, that means 151 degree centigrade or 150 degree centigrade, which means 5 bar steam. But RW is saying that, look, we will change this particle size to a lower one to start with, and in, by doing that way, we can reduce the temperature from here in the heating steam from 150 to 130 degrees. So there is a bit of an upfront milling in here and then um, reducing less, um, less um, uh, temperature, lower temperature of the steam going in. But what is then happening, you need to supply the fluidization steam here. So there are two steams that you are supplying. One is the heating steam, which supplies the heat for drying. The other one is the fluidizing steam, which comes from here circulation blowers. And you see where the circulation blower will be coming, eventually will be coming from? It's in here. So that has to come from somewhere. Where it is coming from? It is coming from the evaporated moisture. I'll need to get two batteries. Evaporated moisture and separated from the dry fines then has to be sent through a blower. Evaporated moisture comes out at one bar and then you have to pressurize it just over one bar. Thank you. Um, so that, um, so that, um, so that uh, it can actually 
go over one bar and can fluidize the wet coal here. Right? So it's a very closed system in the sense that for fluidizing, you are not using anything from outside. You see there is no outside source of fluidizing steam. It's the same steam which is coming from the evaporated moisture from the coal, cleaned and then circulated back through a vapor circulation blower. At the same time though, the heating steam, how it is coming, it is also coming from the evaporated moisture, goes to another set of cleaning, separate set of cleanup, ESP or back filter, electrostatic precipitator or back filter. And then it goes to the vapor compressor. So this is a blower because it is fluidizing steam only at one bar coming from 1 bar to 1.1 bar. So that's why it is called blower. Here it is called compressor because it's compressing the water vapor from 1 bar roughly to 5 bar or so. Right? So there's a difference. But everything is um, uh, uh, closed. You're not getting anything from outside. You're not requiring anything from outside. So this can be modeled quite well. In fact, the problem is um, there are CFD models uh, uh, that these companies use, which I have seen. But, no, but you can do it too. The only thing that you will need is build a fluidized bed dryer, run it, get the pressure drop measurements, get very good uh, particle size measurements. You can use little temperature is very benign use uh, microwave uh, uh, tomography. Someone is do, doing tomography, say, someone, someone said, right? It's tomographic imaging, and then uh, do it, and then publish it for the sake of mankind. <laughs> Some of the condensate can actually, can go to the power plant. But as Shantanu has said, you are actually using the water vapor generated from the steam, uh, sorry, from the coal within the system. So that's why it is entirely closed. But of course, for an engineering design, as you always keep, you will keep a makeup line available if required to fill it. That's an engineering design. Uh, initial startup also, you will need the initial Feeling, right? This steam has to, for initial startup, this heating steam will have to come from external sources. If it is, if the drying plant is located near the power station, you will tap it from the LP turbines, one of the extraction. Uh, the LP turbine does have different extraction point, depending on how many LP heaters you have. It can come directly from there. But that's an engineering design uh, that, uh, uh, that's easy to incorporate. Knowing this one is the fundamentals of this one is the most important thing so that you don't uh, oversize it or don't undersize it. Then you've got problem because then you will not get the dried coal to the size and the moisture content that you need. And therefore, your downstream processing of gasification or whatever, that will be in jeopardy. For the size, for the size of the dryer. Um, yes, yes, and that's what um, uh, the the PhD thesis has shown that after drying, which includes attrition, this is the size you will get, and therefore this should be the feed size going into it. So that was in the domain of the. Uh, true, true, true. So, uh, say for example, the subbituminous coals are much harder. So, the hard grove index, which denotes the hardness of the coal, its friability of the coal, will be a smaller number. Um, 
the, the, so you you need to know that you need to know that beforehand. Yeah. I mean, it uh, there is not a correlation available yet that for naively ignite this in the, in the public domain that for naively ignite this should be the dying temperature, this should be the feed size, this should be the these are known to those people, but publicly. So it's the classic, uh, you know, the CFX versus open form. Do it and finish. Absolutely. That, that's what I'm saying. The no, there is not a single black and white straight solution. Uh, you really need to know it and whatever you don't know, you just develop the uh, knowledge through um, university research or research wherever. And that can be very targeted short term research. I'm not saying that they have to be four year PhD research. And that's the point I always t tell the policy makers that look, don't tell me that, uh, don't ask me to tell you that this is exactly what you need to do. Give me time. Sometimes I'll need two months, sometimes I'll need six months, sometimes I'll need two years, depending on the complexities. I will give you the solution for this. But for drying though, what happens is, naively lignite is extremely homogeneous as far as its moisture content is concerned. I mean, um, I have seen the moisture figure starting from my 1982 uh, uh, days, from the first time when I got uh, involved with NLC's um, uh, work to disappear, and now, also what I see because uh, a company, um, let me not name them, uh, they are uh, working with uh, them now for a different process. Uh, the same moisture content. The moisture content does not significantly differ depending on the mines, different seams, because they are there, the coal is there for millions of years in that area which was a marshy land or sea or whatever. So whatever moisture it has absorbed, it has absorbed. So the moisture content, you will not see a variation of 10% moisture content between this point and that point in the mine. It will be more or less the same. Engineering wise, one, two percentage point variation, maybe depending on the season, summertime, some of the coals on the surface, they get dried a little bit. But apart from that, it will be very uniform with respect to moisture content. It will be very uniform unless you are going deeper into the mine, but lignites are all surface mining. Lignites are not underground mining. So you, are not, you will not see a significant variation day to day in the pore sizes of the coals. So that, that problem will not be there. But of course, a coal based in Juria will be different in moisture content, pore size, etc., compared to a coal at Naivelli. But that will have its own characteristics. This will have its own characteristics. This coal's characteristics are not going to change day to day. This coal's characteristics are also not going to change day to day. So if you design and operate a commission and operate a dryer over there, it should go well. Only thing that can change is the composition of the ash, which, is, which does not affect drying, that affects gasification. And we'll discuss that separately. So drying is a relatively easier problem to solve quickly.
are in the capillaries. It's not going to change significantly. Is also not going to change significant change significant significantly. But what I am not saying is what I am not saying is because it's naively lignite, its conditions are very well known. Let's not analyze it anymore. I am not saying it. It will still be useful to analyze it once and for all because you will need to see an anecdotal difference for the say for the client. I can say whatever I like, but as, a, as the decision maker who gives the money to build the plant, he needs to see the evidence. So it has to be done. All I'm saying is that this is a non-issue, but I'm not paying the money. So, so I have to give him the proof. So it still has to be done. And the point I'm make, also making is that it can be done because the techniques to measure those are available. It's not, uh, it's not um, uh, uh, overly complicated. The technocrats or the scientists still need to know these fundamentals. That's the overarching uh, view that I always convey to everyone. Please don't tell me that you don't need to know it just because this call is there for from my um, from the previous generation, and therefore we know everything about it, maybe. But you know something you know from the literature, something you know from the records. But you still, uh, why the power station still um, keep a daily record of the coal that's going into the power st into the boiler? They keep every shift. They keep a record so that if anything goes wrong. They can identify precisely when it went wrong. So you have to apply the same principle for the, at the design stage as well. I mean, you cannot ask a company, um, this is the call. I'm not giving you any composition. Design for it. They may accept it, but they will, say, they will still insist that we will do the measurements, we will do the analysis, and you will have to pay for it. Otherwise, I'm not going to design and give you the performance guarantee. So whether you give it at the client, sometimes the client gives it, or correct. It was actually developed, steam fluidized by drying. It was developed at Monash University by Professor Wayne Porter in the early 70s, but no one um, gave him my credibility. So the Germans bought the patent and then they commercialized it. So the IP went out from Australia, unfortunately. That's what happens to many academics. Anyway, so this is the uh, fluidized bed. And uh, so what happens in here is that the raw coal up to that size, it's sent through the um, um, lock hoppers. These are the hoppers which go into the dryer. And inside the dryer, heat, drying heat is provided through inbuilt tubes, immersed tubes, through which goes the steam. Okay. And the steam condenses into good quality water. And that um, goes, can, it can go to the condensate uh, as to the power plant, so it's not lost except the ones which are lost in drift. But the water that is released from the dryer, from the coal, comes out in the form of vapor, water vapor. So it's gas. It's not condensate. So what they do is, in their technology, they, because it's vapor, it goes through, it is cleaned, um, and, then, and then it goes through a vapor compressor. So it's uh, compressed, the steam is again compressed, and then, uh, and then supp supplies the additional heat here um, 
here um, inside the dryer. So, so now one important thing to note in here is that this is an atmospheric pressure dryer, which means the temperature inside the dryer um, is close to the saturation temperature of the water vapor coming out from the coal. So that is just around 100 degrees, but there has to be a driving force. So there has to be a temperature difference between this heating steam and the heat uh, temperature of drying. So the heating steam will have to be about 50 degrees higher in temperature. So if you are drying the atmospheric pressure, temperature of the drying is 100 degrees you need to provide steam at 150 degrees. So the saturation pressure, you have to provide the steam at saturation pressure corresponding to 150 degrees, which is roughly 5 bar, slightly more than 5 bar, if you want to give a little bit more superheat to it. Okay? So if you want to dry the coal at higher pressure, which pre previously people have shown that drying at higher pressure has an advantage. It makes everyone everything compressed. Therefore, low fix, uh, lower fixed cost and uh, better contact with the gas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you are also looking at supplying the steam at higher and higher and higher pressure. So, if you want to do the drawing at say 20 bar, you'll be does you'll be if you do the simple calculation, you'll see that you'll have to supply the steam at a very very high pressure, about 50 bars or so. 50 bar steam is not cheap. You'll have to generate it at a high cost. Okay. So, so that's the important thing. Um, it was demonstrated at, uh, at Niederhausen. It was planned at Hazelwood, but um, eventually um, this did not go through. So, um, so um, uh, the other points to remember in here that the finer coal feed is conducive to faster drying, as you would in, uh, uh, imagine. If it, the coal comes here in a, in in milled form then you will, it will dry faster because it is smaller, um, but, but that will make fluidization difficult inside the dryer. As you, as you would expect, drying, uh, sorry, fluidizing something which is very fine, even though it will take less drying time, just keeping it fluidized in order to get the drying done efficiently is not easy. So that is an optimum. And drying pressure, I have said. Then uh, the hot air fluidized bed drawing that has been demonstrated by the GRE, the Great River Energy, in the with funding from the US DOE in North Dakota, in the coal-fired power station. Um, but they have done it only to uh, to dry uh, their lignites from about 38 percent to about 30 percent moisture, um, uh, so eight percentage point. So it cannot be. Uh, I mean, it hasn't been applied to very high moisture coal, let me put it that way. So that's their, basically their scheme, is that they have a hot air fluidized bed dryer. Uh, uh, the hot air fluidizes it, but the heating is also provided with hot water inside the steel, not steam, hot water. That comes, so hot water is less energy intensive than steam is. Um, and then it comes from somewhere within the, within the source. So I have just taken it from Great River Energy's website, they, and it's very well known. And it works over there in that particular area. But the limitations of it are um, what I have written. There are, um, these are the major players. There is a large number of companies in Japan and um, China now are, uh, they have developed com, uh, technologies and um, one for the hydrogen energy supply chain project um, in Victoria, uh, which for which I'm now a consultant and the state government's advisory body as well. They are developing a drying technology based on the Japanese one. So there are Jap different um, technologies offered by the Chinese and the Japanese now. The important thing, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that 
It's an extremely important part of the overall coal utilization process, advanced coal utilization process. You cannot go past drying before you start doing anything else that we will be discussing later on. Uh, then uh, we tried at the Lignite CRC uh, entrained floor drying, entrained means the drying gas and the coal particles, the dried moist and the dried coal particles will always be entrained inside the gas and there is a difference. When you are, you are entraining it, that means the dryer is not seeing any, anything other than the entraining gas, so it is really drying very, very well. Same thing happens for the entrained flow gasifier as well. It's an entrained flow dryer, which means the velocity has to be very, very high, so otherwise it will be just following the Stokes law, and therefore it will not be entrained. So entraining is an important part, and establishing entrainment Maintaining entrainment is extremely, extremely important. It comes from fundamental principles. You can, we can calculate it very well now. Um, so, so that's why you need a very thin dryer, skinny dryer, but very long one. Of course, you cannot build it very tall, therefore you have to have loops. That has its own challenges. We, our lignite says you tried this, but it failed. It came from the development of a process within Victoria by the State Electricity Commission of Victoria, the process called integrated drying gasification combined cycle. So drying and uh, gasification combined in one uh, series of continuous processes. Um, using hot flue gas, not steam. So flue gas contains carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, you know steam, everything. So it's a different kind, um, um, may ensuring that the gas doesn't have oxygen, high oxygen level uh, as the coal is dried. Otherwise, explosibility will be a problem. And the part, in order to entrain, the particle size has to be very, very fine, typically about 100 micron or so. Otherwise, entraining it is very, very difficult. And the final moisture content can be restricted about the equilibrium moisture level. Let me talk a little bit about what's the equilibrium moisture level. Uh, when you are drying a coal, starting from its initial level of say, 60% or 38% or whatever, to what extent you can dry it depends on, as I said, it depends on the uh, moisture content in the gas inside the dryer. So when you dry it to that extent, on, in the, inside the dryer, you will be going only, be, you will be able to achieve only drying to that extent. That's called the equilibrium moisture content. It is in equilibrium with the rest of the gas inside the dryer. So that's what's called equilibrium moisture content. It's a very important concept is in drying. Um, and the other important issue is the explosibility limit. Uh, there has been a lot of work that has been done on the explosion characteristics of dust particles. Say when you make uh, from, uh, from wheat, the flour, wheat flour, um, if you store them in silos, you have to be very, very careful that the oxygen content inside the silos is very low. Otherwise, even those flour can explode. Dried coal and the fine dried coal is no exception. It has got another disadvantage is that it still has got a lot of oxygen inside its matrix as it is dried. So the, there is an explosibility limit of the dried coal or the coal as being dried and that those numbers are very well known. Uh, so the oxygen content has to be limited below 4% four percentage point during the drying medium if you are doing the undertaking the drying using hot air. Otherwise it will go. It will explode. Uh, an explosion is not a pleasant event event. Um, then uh, the other one which we are currently working with Korea, in fact um, my one of my research fellows is going to witness the tests. 
in Korea uh, later this month. The Korea Institute of Energy Research, KIER, they have developed this process called COMDRY. Maybe here, uh, COMDRY. So what it, uh, they have done is a very simplistic model, not simplistic, simple model. They have lots of baffles angle this way and that way, this way, that way, this way, that way. So the cool wet material is fed from the top. The hot air goes counter current uh, from the bottom. So um, the hot air, hottest air is in contact with the driest coal. Has advantages, also has disadvantages. But they have done, uh, they have developed it over a period of time. This is how the um, uh, heat, um, the temperatures and the pinch points look like uh, in the two boxes that has, uh, have been shown. That's their graph, their uh, diagram actually, not mine. Uh, but it's a very simple process. And literally, you can see it, how it is working. So they have, they first did it at a 20 kilogram per hour scale, then they went to 50 kilogram per hour, and now they have gone into five tons per day scale, and that's what they will be testing our uh, Victorian brown coal and um, the biomass that we have shipped over there uh, to do the next bit of trials. But initial bit of trials was very, very positive, both drying efficiency wise and also economics wise. But scaled up one will tell us what is going to happen. And their concept is that if you, that you need to, um, they are very confident of drying, uh, of having a design of 100 ton per day unit. Uh, if the uh, power plant requires 500 tons per day of coal use, then they uh, think they will need five of those rather than one single 500 tons per day unit at this point of time with the knowledge that they have. They will not go into that scale up at this point of time. So this is a very um, simple unit. The other processes that were developed called mechanical thermal expression, which means, uh, mechanical means the coal is mechanically pressed while it is also thermally uh, processed. So you are giving it heat and then you are uh, giving it pressure. So that's what, so what then happens is because you are giving the pressure, the coal, uh, the water is not coming out in the form of water vapor anymore. It comes out in the form of liquid water, which is easier to capture and thermally that process is more efficient. So it started from University of Dortmund and um, at Diffenbacher and um, and uh, there are significant fundamental work done by my colleagues at Monash, uh, but eventually they all found that um, scaling up mechanical thermal expression is a major challenge. So process has been disbanded. It ran out of funding and not good. Then the continuous hydrothermal dewatering CHTD process in which the Tatas were also involved in Tasmania, in um, Australia. Um, so it is, um, it's a very high pressure and temperature that was used. So again, theoretically, it works quite well, but, and um, the Tatas came somewhere here, but um, as far as I know, uh, we are not hearing from them anymore. So you can make your guess what it, it is. And then there are other technologies from um, China and Japan on rotary dryers. So rotary dryers means the coal comes from one end and dried coal goes into the other. The steam comes into the tube or in the shell, depending on how you want to do it. But the whole thing is rotated, so there is a big of a churning effect given. And the rotation gives, the rotation speed gives the residence time. So, so that's what it does the drying. It is a, also a very simple process and it's a low risk process. Um, it's going great guns now, so let's see what happens. Microwave drying at small scale has also been um, uh, attempted and it will remain as a niche activity in my personal view.
will not become a mainstream for processing because as you know, microwave, to produce microwave, you need huge amount of electricity. So some of the cost data, the cost data are mostly proprietary. The technology developers are never going to tell you unless you are going to give them the contract. But, um, and also it depends on whether you are retrofitting a dryer to an existing power station or you are building a new power station and therefore the dryer, you have all the flexibilities to design and choose the type of dryer. So it depends on both those things. Usually for retrofitting, it's very difficult. Uh, it's more difficult, not very difficult. The, the only public level data, publicly available data that you will see is from the Great River Energies process that I showed. It's called the dry fining process. They say that um, for their scale, between US dollar 80 to US dollar 100 per kilowatt net um, of electricity uh, uh, boiler, boiler uh, plant's capacity uh, is the capital cost, and the operational and maintenance costs are about 35 cents per weight ton of lignite processed for a 125 ton per hour dryer. Obviously, if the dryer becomes higher, larger, then the cost will be lower. So, so that's the relative ideas about the techno-economics. Um, so what are the de development? There are still development needs, depending on what type of coal and or what type of biomass, for example, that you want to use. Uh, I would say that uh, this has been demonstrated, SFBD, um, have most technologies have been demonstrated at small to pilot scale, except the RW is dryer, the drying technology. Fluidized bed dryers um, are the front runners, and uh, the only way this, uh, the drying can proceed very, very well is that it's commercially demonstrated if a new drying technology comes on, and that's what is happening in some cases. And uh, it's very important to know the economics of the drying, and you cannot know it very well until you have done the uh, close to full scale uh, operation. Otherwise, costs are very, very difficult to scale up, particularly for this type of processes, with drying processes in particular. And scaling up of any of those technologies, except the RWS one, is a major challenge. Single stage drying may not be the solution at all, and we gave uh, to one of the Japanese developers back in 2012 a solution through CFD modeling. And um, they came up with a particular type of technology 